figure out who it belongs to. Right. Yeah, every child brings it back to me saying it's not theirs. Hello. Now, I think I'm live. Let me go check in the Facebook group. Jordan, would you mind refreshing? Refreshing what? Um, sorry, in the Facebook group for the Fibre Challenge. Do you mind just refreshing and checking if, I'm, if we're on? Oh, I think I'm in there now. Yes. Yes, yes, I am. Excellent. Oh, hello, Sandy. First cab off the rank. Welcome, welcome. All right. I am going to come back here to stream. Like, hey, Nicole, Jody. Hello, hello. All right. Now, I haven't seen Kirsty join us yet. So we'll just, I've sent her a text. She must be busy putting her kids to bed and I'm sure she would join us as soon as she is able, but that's okay because we have a little bit of chatting to do first. A quick housekeeping. Hello, Facebook user. I can, actually, I could tell your names when I clicked over to the Facebook live feed and I could see your names, but because I'll be here in StreamYard for all of the time, um, if you could click that link, um, is it on that? post there's a link you can click that says um that allows me to see your name so if you can click that link and i'll be able to see who it is that i'm talking to when you ask questions or give us feedback that would be really helpful kirsty's joined us let me let her in hello <laughs> how are you i'm good how are you i'm also well yes holidays <laughs> I know, right? That's exactly why I am two minutes late. <laughs> it's just so, it's just so much going on. And I only have two kids. I don't have a full soccer team like you do. So it's still tricky just to get everyone sorted. Oh, it, it definitely can be tricky. But you know what? These holidays, our kids, like all of them, have finally mastered the art of sleeping in. So oh. we have just been loving our mornings with no lunches to make, no breakfast until much later than usual. It's been amazing. That's so cool. Yeah, I took Noah out for training this morning and I had to wake him up for the first time, I think, ever in his life. And, and I kind of had that, is this it? Are we turning the corner? Yeah. Is this the time to shine? And it's like, oh, I'm so stoked about it. So we'll see. <laughs> yeah. um, hello, Tara and Dorita. I'm probably saying your name, right? Um, and a few other people that I can't see your names. Welcome. Thank you for being here. Kirsty and I love these Q&A sessions. It, uh, it, it's really the, the first time we can really feel more connected with you guys because we love commenting in the threads and, you know, you're watching the videos, but there's something special about meeting almost face-to-face -face and actually being yeah. able to have a conversation. So thank you. It's wonderful. So today uh, we are, we've got lots of questions. I was actually surprised because this has been a small group. Usually there's at least double the amount of people in the challenges that we run. So it was a small group, but the question volume has not changed. Oh, yeah. <laughs> in fact, it's the last time perhaps. So yeah. although we may not get to all of your questions tonight, don't worry, Kirsty and I both always make sure that we come back in and pop in for additional ads Q&A times and, and make sure that we address all of the questions that you have. So don't worry about that. But we are going to talk about um, fibre intake in general. Some people had questions about that. We are going to talk about transit times, the Bristol <laughs> stool chart. We've got lots of questions about hoops and number twos. Excellent. Uh, more questions than usual on intermittent fasting and keto mm -hmm. and how to balance that with our fiber levels and Kirsty is the woman to talk to you about that because she does both of those things um we've also got lots of food questions and some randoms at the end so that's the order that we're going to do things in tonight please feel free to post some questions and feedback um in the comments we'll try to keep an eye on that as we go along as well it's been a blast. It's day nine. Tomorrow is the last day. And we actually, I know we've, we've learned a lot of it. And it's hard to think that there's a whole other day's content coming tomorrow. But 
don't be tempted to skip tomorrow's video. Tomorrow is just as important as the rest. We've got our last video tomorrow. Um, but we do also have our live party with my husband, Jordan, who's sitting over there in his dressing gown eating his dinner. Sorry. Dusted. Do you know the funniest thing that's not even it's it's one of those dressing gowns that no one's claiming. Like it's it's a big yeah, yeah. one that we thought it was the kids and everyone just gives it back to us saying it's not mine, Mum. So anyway, Jordan's claimed it. But anyway, tomorrow we're going live at the warehouse to give your ebook and a savings code for those people who want to stock up on fibre blends or whole foods that are rich in fibre. Um, and we're going to give out a slew of prizes tomorrow as well. So that's tomorrow and we will be giving you a binge watch page because I know that there's going to be people who want to catch up on videos before they come down on Monday night. If you don't get to watch all of the videos before Monday night, they'll be available for purchase after that. But try to try to catch up on that binge watch page over the weekend if that's what you want to do. And on Thursday next week, Kirsty is going to hold an info session for all those people who are asking me questions about how they can further their gut healing and work about work on specific issues that they've identified either before or during this challenge. So we will send a link to register for that. So and that's next Wednesday, Lainey, next Wednesday. Oh, I'm sorry. It's Wednesday. It's the 14th, isn't it? Yeah. I hope it's next Wednesday. Yes. yes. Yeah. Thank you for clarifying. We have, we that. have it. Yeah, no, that's all good. <laughs> good, good, good. Um, so we'll share the link with that. And then the last thing that Kirsty is also going to offer, I know there's been a few comments in the group already saying, how can I get that beautiful diversity dough? She's going to give you a bundle offer for those people as well. So there's still lots coming your way, lots of goodies and giveaways and great things for you guys coming. But tonight we're here for questions. Let's get stuck in. <laughs> Kirsty. Oh, you can get started on the first one. Yes, sorry, I just had to yeah. readjust something on my screen. Okay, no, so I feel like I'm falling down. It's all right. <laughs> there we go. All right, so we are talking about some general fibre intake questions. The first one um, we wanted to cover, Kirsty, something that sometimes gets missed in the challenge, and some people write in weeks afterwards with 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 I guess a a response to us not focusing on this enough. I want to be really clear about a really great guideline to follow when we're increasing our fibre. So Kirsty, can you tell us what that is? Yeah. So you, you can eat too much fibre too quickly. So when you introduce fibre, it's really important to go low and slow. So it is that kind of slow and steady. It's the whole tortoise and the hare situation. So when you're introducing fibre, if it's not something that's been in your diet previously, you really need the mechanics to be able to digest it in your gut microbiome. So the mechanics being the little army, all the little beautiful bacteria in your gut, you need them in there to digest the fibre. So if they're not there now, which is for most people that's the case because they have had a low fibre diet, a really traditional diet that you know, it just doesn't have a lot of fiber, especially vegetable fiber and cellulose. And um, so when you start, you've got to go slowly so you can build up and feed those beautiful microbes so they multiply and grow. And so then when you eat more and more fiber, then you've got the, the factory, you've got the tribe, you've got the soldiers to break it down, to be able to ferment it, to metabolize it and make the most of it. So just go really, really low and slow. So you can eat too much fibre when you get started and get all enthusiastic and want to eat a lot of fibre because you know how good it is for you. So you go low and slow and then you want to get up to about that 30 to 35 grams in a day. So, But for some people, that's actually a massive stretch from where they are right now and that's completely fine. And um, don't feel like you're failing or don't feel like you aren't doing enough to get there. It takes people time. So you give yourself mm -hmm. some, some credit and give yourself some patience that um, this is a whole new way of eating and a whole, whole new world. So 
Um, I yeah. Else, anyone else singing the Aladdin song in their head right now? Um, <laughs> how much time would you say is a good approximate guide if someone's trying to raise their fiber from, say, 15 grams to 30? five grams how much time would you say is a good amount of time to gradually build so to gradually build to a point where where all of your beautiful systems in your body are comfortable with it they're digesting it they're detoxifying it you're able to move it with your in your stool and to have a beautiful evacuation it's nice and perfect on that bristol stool chart I would allow yourself a good three months to be able to have everything working in synergy. So that doesn't work very well for most people who, uh, you know, want the quick fix and the quick, um, you know, I want to be out of eating fibre by next week. So, yes, you could get up to 35 grams in a week but it takes time for everything else in your body to catch up. So give yourself some time. So step by step, just even increasing, you know, five grams per week so your body can get used to it and eliminate it effectively and not cause any, you know, too much of a side effect like any extra toxins or gases or brain fog or quick diarrhea or elimination or compaction, all these things that can happen when you change and increase more fibre. It just makes it easier. You don't have to worry about going so fast. We don't want to be creating more digestive problems when we're trying to <laughs> fix our digestive problems. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I love the way that you've explained that. Thank you. So I hope everyone remembers that low and slow and, of course, lots of water. Mm. We're going to talk about water tonight as well. There's been lots of questions about water. Okay. Yeah, Jody, that is good to know. It's very important. Um, mm. Asta wanted to know. Oh, she's, you've already covered that one. Okay, mm -hmm. Bernadette has asked the golden question that gets asked every time in the Five Challenge and rightly so. As parents, we can sometimes feel concerned that our children aren't getting enough fibre or perhaps we're not sure how much fibre they should be aiming for because their bodies are smaller. Kirsty, can you tell us where our kids and our, our partners who might be big solid men or um, large and small people, how much fibre should they be shooting for? Yeah, so really it... It's going to be different for, for everyone and different for kids and different for, you know, how much their gut microbiome has developed as well. So our gut microbiome isn't fully developed until our children are seven. So we've got to be really nurturing that gut microbiome and not throwing too many things in there. It's like if you planted a new lawn out the front of your house you're not then going to suddenly run out when you've got these new little shoots sprouting up and throw this on it and throw that on it and, and do too much with it. All you want to do is nicely water it and hope the sun comes out and go really, you know, smooth and slow with that beautiful lawn. And it's the same with children if we don't want to be doing too much and too much change. So, you know, we don't want to see people introducing you know, fibre blends and all these kinds of things. Obviously, the ones that Lainey's got are whole foods, but I do see ones that are more medicinal or supplements and they're giving it to their children because they want the best for them, which is exactly what we want to do. But their little bodies don't need it. So we want to just be making sure that each meal, every time they put something into their mouth, it's nutrient-dense, it's quality and that it has a robust amount of fiber in it. And then the children will be quite self-selecting with how satiating, satiated they feel, so how full they feel. So we don't wanna to get too hung up on the fiber for our kids because you, you know, when they're going through a growth spurt, they just won't eat that and they feel really picky or when they don't feel so well or they're feeling stressed at school. There's so many anomalies with children so the minute we try and put an arbitrary number on the fibre, that sets us up for feeling like we've failed, which we do really well as parents anyway. We can just be <laughs> sitting around doing nothing and we feel like we've failed. So, <laughs> but, you know, let's try not to make this sort of big arbitrary thing. And so all we need to remember is every time you nourish your children, make sure it's just that best quality 
full of fiber, really nutrient dense and rich, and, and you will not fail. You just will not fail and you'll get that beautiful amount of fiber. But children are about, the, depending on the age, quite similar to adults in the amount of fiber that you want to give them. And then for men as well, you know, if you've got a big burly guy, it, it's not more is better when it comes to fiber. So it doesn't matter if you're six foot tall or you're five foot. The microbiome doesn't sort of, you know, adjust to the length of your bones. So, you know, you can overdose on it. So you want to keep that nice sort of 30 to 35 grams. But give once again, you know, just, just watch it with the kids and don't go too hardcore when their gut isn't developed enough and isn't ready. I love that because it can become a stressor in, in the dynamic of the relationship between parent and child mm -hmm. around the dinner table and we're trying to force food into them and then they get panicky and, and stressed. And as you speak to so beautifully, when a child is stressed, they're not going to be able to digest those beautiful fibres that we're giving them. So we need to keep food a pleasurable, positive experience for our children. And if we can mm -hmm. remove the stress and remove the big expectations we have for ourselves and focus on just one thing at a time and improving the nutrient density of those foods that they do put into their mouth, then we're going to be on the right track. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So Bernadette also asked another question. Um, it kind of goes along with this that, that same point. She was wondering yeah. whether we can consume too much fibre in one sitting. And I, I think I commented in the on her question already saying that I think our body will reach that satiety point before overdose on fibre in one sitting. Would that be fair to say, Kirsty? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you, you, you want to get to the point and this is, this takes some time to get to this point. So don't worry if you don't feel this already, but you want to get to the point where you're getting the appropriate signals that you are full and that you are satiated. So a lot of people don't get those signals. You know, a lot of people just just keep eating, keep eating. This was certainly me when it came to chips and donuts. It was pretty bad. And so there was just kind of no flick. There was nothing turning off the adrenaline, like all of our hormones that manage our ability to be able to switch off and feel full and to stop eating a lot of them become very disorganized and out of balance. So, you know, you if you don't have those signals and you're not getting that satiety point, then that's certainly something more to investigate. But, yes, we normally just have had enough. We don't need any more. So you, you generally can feel it. Isn't that a great thing to remember? Because sometimes we can get a little bit hard on ourselves for overeating on stuff that we know is not serving us. And sometimes mm. we can wake up in the morning and decide, I am not going to have that packet of chips today or whatever it might be that our yeah. weakness is. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. If we can actually realise, you know, there are there are situations where perhaps, like you said, those hormones aren't functioning properly and we're not getting the signals. It's not always about our willpower that are, that yeah. are weak. That it's, yeah. you know, and the same goes for that 3 p.m. slump that we've been speaking about already in the challenge. It's not our willpower. We need yeah. to make sure our body's in balance. Yeah. Oh, I see it all the time, almost every day. Like I had a client yesterday literally crying on a call with me because she um, just literally could not go into the post office and walk past, you know, the devil, which is all they do it for a reason. They know exactly where you're going to be standing. They want to get you at your low, lowest moment when you're lining up. But, you know, we know that at that three or four o'clock, that's when our resources are quite low, when our cortisol levels start to go up and our insulin levels are going to go up. And the minute our insulin levels go up, we almost don't have that willpower or control anymore. Our body at that primal set point wants to take on more energy, so quick energy, so carbs and sugar, because it thinks it's on high alert because the cortisol and the stress and the adrenaline is up. It thinks it's on high alert and that it needs to action now. So it's bringing in all these resources it's getting ready for the, you know, the big bonanza, the, the elephant or someone running after you or, you know, the big problem, which never happens. It's generally an email or a phone call or something. So, 
you know, we we want to make sure that instead of berating ourselves on how crap we are about being able to, you know, wake up and make a decision about eating great food, we should be looking at our cortisol levels and how, you know, when you go into shops where you're tempted or when you feel like taking that extra bit of chocolate in the afternoon, if you just sat and closed your eyes and took three deep breaths and brought your heart rate down under 70, it completely switches off all of those triggers that I was just talking about and you just don't request food anymore because your body is now like, oh, well, I'm safe. I don't need to take on any extra food because I don't need to action a plan of running away. So um, a, a big one, a big one is for mums when you're just about to kick, pick up your kids from school or get them off the bus or do the after school craziness. That's when I see mums get quite elevated and reach for foods that just doesn't support them, but they it's quick resources. So take your breath, sit in the car, <laughs> get your heart rate down, learn how to measure your heart rate. It's just like the biggest game changer. I can attest to that. I, I have avoided many a snack using that exact method. Yeah. It definitely works. It definitely works. Um, hey, Kaya. My daughter just came home. Mm. Um, Ali has asked. She's been eating low FODMAP for six months for her irritable, irritable bowel syndrome, um, which takes out many grains and other fibres. How do you suggest that she increases her fibre and what is your opinion on the low FODMAP diet? Okay. So um, Dr Sue Shepherd, who introduced the low FODMAP diet many years ago now, um, it, it's a wonderful, wonderful diet to implement in a very, very short term and short time frame to reduce symptoms. So if you've got extreme, you know, diarrhea or extreme constipation, if you've got any, so any form of pain or blood in your stool, the FODMAP diet is great to put out the fire. So cool down that inflammatory response. But you do not want to be on a low FODMAP diet for longer than two to four weeks. So if you are on a low FODMAP diet for longer than that, then you need to be doing more investigation and to understand what is going on and why that's happening, which you can do through stool tests. There's lots of awesome ways that you can investigate that. So I am a really great fan of low FODMAPs. I needed to use it actually about a month ago. I got gastro I got food poisoning I got I went down both ends it was all happening it was oh, like yeah. 1993 revisited it was horrible but <laughs> you know for about a week after that I did a you know a broth fast I went really low FODMAPs and I just rested my gut I gave it an opportunity just to get back on track again but you need to rebuild and you need to move on from that low FODMAP. So um, it's very, very important. Please do not be on it for much longer. So um, in saying that, you don't, you know, you only need to be on it for a couple of weeks. So it's easy to then move forward to increase your fiber. Now, if you come off your low FODMAP diet and instantly have a flare or you instantly have gut pain or any of your symptoms coming back, it's really important that you find the answer. So go and, you know, get a test. Don't guess what's going on. Actually find out from a stool analysis what is causing the flare and the inflammation. So then you can recover from that and then you can introduce more fibre and introduce a more of a variety of foods rather than being stuck in a bit of a loop which I see. I see it all the time, all the time. It's one of the most common things that I see. Yeah, look, I think that's so important to know because judging from comments in various groups over time, some people have put themselves on a low FODMAP diet for an extended period of time, mm. not knowing that it can be quite harmful to the microbiome yeah. at time because it's including all these foods. Um, yeah. So that's really lovely to know. And actually, um, two of our children have um, just sent in their stool test through cultured wellness to microbia <laughs> so we're waiting for the results and yeah. um, I'm so excited to see what is going on because so often we just guess like I mean yeah. you, you always say test don't guess but so often we just think 
there's no option to really know what's going on inside of us. And it's so empowering to, to really know. I'm so excited to, to get yeah. that. I know, I know. I was going to ask you, like, have you sent them in yet? Because yeah. I'm... <laughs> yeah. So, um, Sandy, we, Culture Wellness organises all the stool tests. So that's what we do. So we can certainly help you out with that. But, um, yeah, so, Ali, like, I was on a low FODMAP diet for over two years. So I learnt this the really, really oh. hard way. That's why I'm very passionate about it. So, um, yeah, I, ha I can speak from a, a lot of painful experience on that oh, one. Um, all right, we're going to shift gears a little into the topic of the transit time. The thing, you know, assessing these challenge is always a blast. Everyone gets behind it. It's so much fun. And um, it's been really great to read the results everyone's had. And I think this group, more than other groups in the past, have actually been mostly pretty well within that 12 to 24 oh, hour window. Yeah. But of, course, of course, there's always going to be a portion of people either side. And we want to talk um, with you, those people tonight, just to help you understand what it means and what you can do. So Kirsty, a slow transit time being less than around 12 hours, sorry, fast, and a slow being more than 24 hours. And some were as yeah. many as much as days after the fact, after yeah. they the sesame. Can you please um, spend a couple of minutes talking about what the slow and fast transit times mean and what we can do about it? Yeah, yeah. So the slow transit time gives us an indication that the mechan there's a difference between the mechanics being uh, sluggish and broken and also the microbes in our gut. So there's two reasons for that. So if you've got really slow transit time, that peristilic action, which moves our food through, can be very sluggish. And stress is a massive one on that. Our thyroid function is a really big one on that. Our vagal tone, which we'll get into, which is our, our nerve that basically just supports our stress response and supports smooth motility. If we have poor tone in our vagal nerve, it can impact it. So function-wise, that can be a problem. And even just not learning how to sit on the toilet properly can cause slow transit time. So, you know, they, they, you got, there's these things called squatty potties or you can get a couple of books or you can do all sorts of things. I've seen, I've seen it all, including footprints on the top of a toilet seat so you can <laughs> squat on the top, um, which I have done before. I've done a lot of travelling. So it's sometimes a cleaner option than sitting on toilets. But, um, you know, you want to raise up your legs to get into a position of actually being able to eliminate properly. So um, even the position of how we eliminate our stools, slow transit obviously is whether the bowel has hydrated. So we, our body and our cells might be hydrated, but whether the bowel has hydrated to be able to move those stools through. So that's some of the reasons for the slow one. Sorry, I'll go back. There's you know, a couple of others. Your hormones. Can I play you? Sorry, can I interrupt you there, Kirsty? You said there's a difference between the cell body being hydrated and our bowel being hydrated. Can you yeah. um, say how that could happen? Yeah, yeah. So our bowel can not be hydrated when um, we have this constant sort of flush through where there's not the electrolytes we don't have any of the minerals and the nutrients. So when it comes in, it, when it goes into our cells, we can sometimes, or not go into our cells, we can sometimes find that it just flushes through and then the microbes and the gut lining is too inflamed and it can't hydrate it as well. So um, it, it's not just as simple as throwing the water in. And also the quality of the water, which I think I saw is one that we're going to get to right at the end. If it's got mm. tap water in there, if there's um, any form of chlorine, if it doesn't have the minerals or the nutrients, that can also affect whether our cells hydrate and then whether our bowel hydrates. Mm. So it's about the level of, inf yeah, the level of inf inflammation in there. So slow transit time can also be caused by hormonal fluctuations as well. So if we have a lot of hormonal fluctuations, it can either swing the two. So there are a few reasons for that slow transit time. The fast transit time is mostly inflammation. 
So our bodies are super smart. If we eat something that is inflammatory to our body and causes inflammation, our our body sometimes, not everyone's body, but sometimes will just naturally want to get it out or will want to eliminate it. And so that can cause that fast transit time. If there's no stomach acid to digest the food, if there's no digestive enzymes, if there's no beautiful bacteria in that digestive process to slow it down and to digest it, it just comes whooshing on through. So in both, both ways, the mechanics and the functions of the body have, are just not working effectively. And we can really drill down for each person what's going on for them, whether it's slow or fast, which is very, very cool. Very cool. It is very cool. And you were talking about those fast transit times. There were a few of those in the group. And one of those things that you've mentioned, if we don't have enough digestive enzymes, that could be perhaps that we're eating too quickly, right? Because we're not sitting yes. and allowing our mind to tell our body that food is coming, get ready and get those digestive enzymes cranking. Then if yes. we're just walking our food down on the run, which so many of us parents do, I know, that that can be a cause for these fast transit times, yeah? Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, once again, let's not forget that our digestive system is just a hollow tube. And so if it goes from the mouth and it's a hollow tube straight out the other end. So if all of the functions along the way in that hollow tube aren't working, it will just go straight down, literally down the hollow tube. So we've got to make sure everything's working. And as you said, digestion starts in our brain. It starts in the a part of our brain, which is called the cephalic part of our brain. And that is the first trigger that digestive system is happening so yeah if you're driving a car if you're watching tv if you're having an argument with your partner or whatever's going on if you're just you know absent-mindedly eating food you won't digest it and then the body doesn't know what to do with it it sees it as a a foreign body a, for, a foreign protein and it will either want to eliminate it straight away or it will bring it in and cause a massive inflammatory response. And that always reminds me of that classic study that those those who um, learn about child psychology would know called Pavlov's dogs, yes. where they just ring the bell and the dog starts salivating. And that's because our yeah. brain is, well, they tell, told their body that food was coming, get ready. And so they start developing all yeah. that saliva, getting ready. So our brain is super powerful. Um, yeah. Kirsty has asked a question here. She is um, she's 22 and a half weeks pregnant. Um, she's already doing daily exercise and drinking plenty of water. How could she improve her transit time? Is it is it a hormonal issue when you're pregnant that you tend to hold on to those stools longer? Yes. So there's a whole lot going on. So it's it's much much harder because it takes about 500 mils of blood to digest one meal. That's a significant amount of blood, <laughs> significant. So if you are digesting, all that blood should be rushing to your gut and doing its job. If you are doing other things like growing a baby, for example, that blood is going to be going to do other stuff. So when you are pregnant, it is even more imperative to sit down and really relax to digest your food. Otherwise, you're going to find that slow transit time, the mechanics, the digestive enzymes, the stomach acid, all of those things aren't going to be working effectively. So literally even sit there on, you know, at the table and, and almost visualise where the blood's going to go at that point in time. Are we growing baby or can I just digest a bit of food here, please? Because we need to, I need some nutrients. So really think about where the resources in your body are going. Now, the no, other thing that... Sorry, I think you should record a meditation for pregnant women <laughs> <laughs> at mealtimes. <laughs> Imagine your blood. Um, so <laughs> the other thing is um, make sure that you're really ut utilising the, the care of a chiropractor. I cannot stress that enough mm. when it comes to your ileocecal valve function, your Houston valve function. These are all the valves that open and shut between your small intestine and your large intestine. 
they can get super sluggish when we are pregnant and you can manipulate and stimulate that in chiropractic care and also um, making sure that you utilize acupuncture and fermented foods. So fermented foods are going to be your best friend and game changer when you're pregnant because they provide the digestive fire to help you digest that food. So it's kind of like the little helping hand that you need. So almost every meal when you're pregnant should have some form of fermented foods. It only needs to be a tablespoon. Yeah. I said, I wish I knew that when I was oh, pregnant. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, actually, I wish I knew that well before I fell pregnant because all the preconception care is so important for anyone listening who is going through that phase of their life. One, um, my chiropractor the other day asked me if I knew you, Mark Possels. Ah, oh, stuff you- it. Yeah. Yeah. He's a yeah. good chiropractor. Um, well, I was really hanging out know. with his wife and his son up at Cindy's farm on Sunday. That's classic. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, Liz Holman has asked, um, it, it's quite a long question, so I'm just going to give you a summary. Um, okay. She has, quite, she has quite sluggish bowels. She's drinking two litres of water a day. She's eating the ketogenic diet. She's doing intermittent fasting. She's got good amounts of fibre. What going on for her? What advice would you give her to look at those sluggish bowels in that long transit time? Yeah. Okay. So this was a long one. So I actually wrote some notes um, just so I could get my head around it. So interestingly, she said that due to bowel problems, um, at times she's had all bran and oats, for example, even though they're restricted for her. So if you've got bowel issues, you've got bowel inflammation or bowel troubles, you re- it's really important to have at least six months off of gluten. So if we're feeling sluggish or we're feeling like, oh, I just want to you know, get this compaction out, it's really important to um, utilise other tools and other supports than um, having the gluten because that will cause more inflammation. The next thing is that when someone is doing a ketogenic diet and they're fasting, um, they often don't have enough fiber it's as simple as that and they don't go into what we know as cyclical ketosis and cyclical ketosis is when you go in and out of ketosis and you have days where you have beautiful amount of nurturing fiber and carbohydrates and then other days where you fast and you keep everything nice and lean so we can't just eat the same way every single day and we can't be keto and we can't intermittent fast every single day because our body gets used to that. Our microbes get used to that. We need to change it up. So we, we really, really, really want to be over the course of the week looking at uh, are we getting a diversity? So Dr. Terry Walls talks about 200 different types of foods, teas, fibres, spices, um, you know, an array of food that makes up the 200 different types of foods in one year. So it's a a really cool little challenge. We should do that one as a whole year challenge, Lainey. Yeah, we should, we should. Yeah, so, so make sure over the course of the week you're getting enough of that, not just in one day because a lot of people try and get it in one day. And, yeah, I would highly recommend that you don't just keto and intermittent fast all the time, all the same every day because it will cause a lot of bowel problems. Um, And also the other thing um, that I wrote here was exercise. Why would I have written that? Make sure that you move. And the other thing is to make sure that you get in the diversity dough, so lots of um, fermented fibres. So the carbs and the sugars have been broken down and you're left with the resistant starches and left with the good quality fibres. So we'll get to that in a minute. But, yeah, the key there is the cyclical ketosis and not going too lean and not coming in and out of that. Beautiful. And actually something that we often used to ask people to do as part of a challenge in another another challenge that we ran was to keep a list, just a piece of paper on a magnet on the fridge with a little pen blue tack to it if you need, 
And every time you eat something, just write down all the different foods yeah. you're doing and look at it at the end of the week and just yeah. see how many, yeah. see how much diversity you're getting in because diversity is something that we've focused a little bit on this week and it's incredibly important, not just from a fibre diversity perspective, but from a nutrient diversity perspective yeah. as well. So yeah. try that as a little fun exercise on the school holidays with your kids, get them writing. They love to add to the list and every time they eat something, they'll write down and it educates them so gently and effectively yeah. when you introduce little games and challenges like that. Mm. Okay, um, Paula, um, okay, I feel like. I'm up, to, I'm up to Kelly. Where are you up to? I think I've lost my clothes. Oh, here we go, Kelly. Here we go. I'm on cool. the page. Okay, so as a family, I think my stapled papers might be, oh, no, it is. As a family, we can see all the numbers on the Bristol stool chart. <laughs> um, <laughs> she is looking forward to learning ways to incorporate extra fibre. Mr. 17 can jump from two to six a lot of the time and frequent tummy upsets. That does no. not sound fun. He misses no. school, which so he can't afford to do in year 11. Um, Kirsty, what would you say for Mr. 17? Yes. So uh, number one, dear Mr. 17 has probably got that many hormones pumping around in his body. There's all sorts of things going on. So we want to make sure that his liver is functioning effectively to detoxify those hormones. So it would be interesting, Kelly, if he has a lot of acne, that's a surefire indication that his liver function is sluggish and he needs a lot of help with that. So that's the first thing. But the second thing is, um, I've written here a test and then I've written parasites there. So when we see these big fluctuations and we also see um, like a bit of a swinging of it's fine sometimes and then get the big sort of tummy upsets and then it's okay for a week or two and then it flares again, when you see those kinds of changes happening, you really want to be investigating parasites and want to be investigating any any form of gut infections. So, and that's easy. Once again, you can do a stool test. Um, he has acne. Okay, yeah. Alrighty. So, number one, got to focus on his liver. So, if he's got acne, he would be like Mr. Cranky Pants, angry all the time, cranky, moody, the kind of you know seventeen year old male. So that's not fun to live with. So you definitely need to sort it out. And then um, make sure that you get a stool analysis for him to find out what's going on because, yeah, after year 11 comes year 12 and he's got to be firing on all cylinders to get through that. So um, there's a few things there that I would do. Beautiful. Thank you, Kirsty. It's good to see you here, Kelly. It's nice when um, people who ask the question are actually on live. Oh, Lovely. Um, so Kelly also asked for ideas for how to get fibre into, or sneaky ideas for how to get fibre into Mr. Eight um, <laughs> yeah. and, um, and also for her teenage son too. Kelly, I, um, because there might be some issues going on for your 17-year-old, I'm just going to skip over the teenage ideas, but I'll post it in the group as a general um, idea base for those with teenagers who want to smack in that fibre for them. Um, it is it is a really important age to make sure that they are, as, as Kirsty has touched on, it's a really important age to make sure that they are getting lots of fibre and also the good fats and the protein to help their brain fire at school, etc. So I'll post that in the group in the coming couple of days. Um, but as for Mr. Eight <laughs> with his sort of sneaky, sneaky food, <laughs> one of the things that I love to talk about is how to boost nutrition on the sly for your family because it's a simple win and I think that if the more simple easy wins that we can get to help our family you know thrive with their levels of nutrition the better and yes we do want to be educating them along the way so that they're aware of what they're having and why is it good for them and and, and how does it make them feel but as an initial stage I am not ashamed to boost nutrition on the sly and not even tell them about it. Yes. <laughs> yeah, but she knows what I do. She's old right now. <laughs> just don't, just don't tell Rosie. Just don't tell Rosie. That's it. Um, so some of the things that you can do. Again, I think I might post some recipes up in the group because it would be easier than going through them all right here in the Q and A. 
but um, there's a go-to pikelet and pancake recipe that is boosted with lots of diverse foods and fibres, even red lentils. That's one of my favourite tricks mm. is to just whiz up some red lentils um, and add that to your flour. So if you're making pancakes, uh, make sure you're using whole grain flour to start with instead of white flour. Sub out half of it with just a mixture, a blend of all these different goodies that we've been talking about during this challenge. Um, half the amount of fibre, say a whole grain spelt flour for those who can have spelt, is a great base. And then you add on all these different things. You can add buckwheat flour, you can add red lentil flour, you can add tiger nut flour, cinnamon, coconut flour, all these beautiful goodies that we can fit in there and they won't even know. Um, you can also reduce the sugar in a whole range of ways, but it's probably a little bit off topic. I'll post that in the group. Um, if your kids are not a big fan of chia puddings, but you really want to get that into them, what you can do is give them a chocolate mousse. And all that is, is just a chia pudding, the dry part for the chia pudding, whizzed up in the blender first. Then you add your liquids. And when it sets, it is literally just like a chia, uh, sorry, a chocolate mm -hmm. mousse. And yeah. lots of people say that that's the only way that they can get it in because sometimes you don't like the texture, you know, like the fish egg texture that some people complain about with the chia pudding. Often it's not an issue for people, but sometimes you just don't like the texture. And so whizzing that up into a chocolate mousse is a great way to go. Sprinkling things on into their porridge or whatever, using linseed, cinnamon, those things are fantastic. Guacamole and hummus are usually well received with kids. That's a great way to get in lots of um, good fats and protein and fibre all in the one go. Yeah. Um, quinoa crumble is another great go-to. If, um, if they don't like the one-for-one -one swap out rice for quinoa, then using cooked quinoa in your crumble topping or anything, just get creative with the stuff that you're already making at home. Just think, okay, well, how can I just just hide a little bit of this in here and boost a little bit of that in there. I actually have a drawer next to my stove top that I pull out. It's got all my spices and herbs in there, but it also has things like dulse flakes and it has things like a bone broth powder and it will have um, the red lentil, um, the red lentils whizzed up into a flour, all these little boosters that you can just throw in as you're doing it. So it's no more effort than putting in some salt and pepper into your meat. Yeah. Yeah. Kirsty, what are some of your go-tos for <laughs> well, things? Yes, well, it was interesting because someone just said there's sadly no luck with the chocolate mousse either. So when you have produced and you have served that food 50 times to your child, then you can come back and tell me that they don't like it. So we know that children <laughs> we know that children will not eat food the first time. They just won't. So accept that they're not going to do that and keep offering. So as a primal mechanism within our children when they're first born, they are designed to be very wary of food because when they crawl around, they can pick things up and when they're out in nature, they can pick things up that can kill them because there's obviously little... Um, nice dressing gown there, Jordan. They can be... <laughs> I just, I just saw the blue sleeve. <laughs> oh, um, so they're designed, no. yeah. So the kids are designed to, you know, grab the berry and to try it and go, oh no, I might hurt myself with that. And so that's what is their natural set point. So a child pretty much is going to pick something up. They're going to be all wary of it. They're going to kind of try it, and then they're going to put it back. And after many times of seeing you sit down and eat the beautiful food with them and you being part of the process and them watching you eat it, then the message goes to their brain, oh, this is actually really safe food because there's mum and dad and nana and papa eating, my, eating this food, so it must be really safe. So I might just, just give this little bit a try and slowly but surely. But if you've given something once it they will not like it so you've got to you've got to sort of settle in for the long winter um and you will get there and it's amazing what you can introduce to your children but also but the other thing that I had in my notes here is that if your children's gut bugs are out of balance they will always select options that are going to suit 
the bugs needs not them so if they've got an overgrowth if they've got an imbalance if they've got parasites if they've got anything going on in their gut they will crave the foods that feed those issues rather than feeding their good gut bugs and of course that's the crappy white food and it's the carbs and it's the sugar and it's the chocolates and the lollies and so it's not it's not their fault they are only craving what is happening physiology, physiologically in their body. So they would be my two bits of advice. So I always find it funny. I'm, I'm such a t teacher at heart. It's like, don't tell me they don't have it. You tried it once. Off you go. Off you go and fix it. Oh, well, look, there's plenty of evidence to support that. Plenty yes. of evidence to say that our taste buds will literally change over time as well with the amount of exposures. And it doesn't yeah. even need to be a taste exposure. We can use any one of our five senses to help our children become more exposed to food. You can have them play with the food, yeah. smell the food, just look at the food. You can do any yeah. of those things and it will absolutely help your child desensitise to that food. Yeah. Um, Kirsty was uh, just... I've just, I've just got to, I've got to laugh though because tonight I was my mum's actually up here from South Australia. She's stuck here at the moment, but it's so cool to have her. Um, and anyway, Maya had this beautiful butter chicken curry, right? And she didn't. She was just not interested. Didn't want to eat it. And then she started making like a, a like a craggy waterfall and putting the, the top of it through this sort of crack from the chicken, she'd made it into a waterfall and was pouring it down. And in my mum's generation, don't play with your food, you know. And then I went over there, I was like, Maya, this is like an art installation. Let's move the chicken to make it look like a craggier outcrop and let's put more into the pool. And so she made literally an art installation out of this curry and then before you know it, it was gone in two seconds flat. And um, yeah. so there's a generational thing as well because my mum sat there a bit like, you can't play with your food. But we, we everyone got there in the end. So <laughs> That's so great. Um, how old's Maya again? She's about 10? She's 12. Yeah. Uh, she's uh, no, 11. 11. Just okay. 10. Yeah, 11. Too far. Um, yeah. Yeah, and even having your children pass you the ingredients and have you help cook dinner, just the and pick, pick, picking them out at the market or at the shop, saying, "Hey, your job is to go and find that broccoli," and that's an exposure mm -hmm. for them. So it can be, you know, as easy as that. But we should move on. Um, someone yeah. asked, "Oh, Jody, you asked, do you soak the red lentils first before whizzing them into a flour?" That would be ideal, Jody. Mm -hmm. And I don't always do it, but I did read something quite interesting. Red lentils actually have less than fifty percent. Um, of the amount of phytates as some of the other pulses. And so even though it is important, and Kirsty will probably give me a wrap over the knuckles for this, but it's probably, the red lentils is probably the least important one to be doing that soaking and drying before you whisk it up into a flour. But yes, mm -hmm. that would be the ideal approach. Cool. Um, can I that? just make a, a comment there? Cause I won't be able to let it go. Um, <laughs> someone just said, uh, tried the chia pudding without grinding up the seeds and dear um, Miss Six vomited. So with the gag reflex, if there's not really much to chew on and you've got a lot of that soft food going through the palate and there's a vomit going on, I highly recommend um, to get to see a chiropractor and look at those primitive reflexes and specifically that gag reflex because that gag reflex is um, associated with that vagal tone that I was talking about, which is um, letting our body know that we're calm and we're safe and everything's all right. So when you've got that um, real kind of extra vomit issue going on there with food, off to the chiropractor, very important. You're full of interesting information, Kirsty. <laughs> Isn't she, guys? <laughs> um, now, before we move on, I just don't want to lose this question. Um, I don't know your name, sorry, it just comes up as Facebook user. I don't think I fully evacuate as I go first thing in the morning and then I usually go again within half an hour or less and then a few more times during the day. I can go at least four to five times a day. I'm a five to six on the Bristol chart. Okay. So there's, you know, some people can go three, four times a day, eliminate beautifully and have awesome functioning bowels. So it's you don't have to go once a day and three times a day 
if they're beautiful formed stools, that's great. If you are going more and you have this feeling of incomplete evacuation, the first thing that I would try is to get one of those squatty potties that I was talking about. It could just be an alignment issue and um, bringing your knees up turns that whole canal into a situation that it kind of just slides out. It's go onto the Squatty Potty website. You can actually see how it slides out. Um, so if that doesn't help, then um, you might want to look at bulking up your stools a little bit more um, or looking at possibly some inflammatory issues that are going on there that it's making it come um, more often, making you eliminate more often. But um, yeah, the first thing is I'd look at your positioning. If you ever go camping and you squat in the um, in the bush, uh, a lot of people find out. Oh, that is how you are supposed to do a poo. That feels. <laughs> <cool. laughs> it's amazing what difference it makes, really. I mean, even just oh. the pity stools from IKEA or wherever you know, yeah. it's great. Yeah, yeah. Okay, the last question on transit times before we move on. Diane asked, um, her transit time was thirty hours, so not that much past the twenty-four, but just outside. Um, she's a three or four on the Bristol stool chart at the moment, been a one to mm -hmm. two in the past, mm -hmm. drinks plenty of water, has 35 to 40 whopping grams of fibre a day, and she Yay. wants to increase her transit time. Okay. All right. So the first thing is definitely look at, um, depending on where you are in, in your age bracket, definitely look at hormone function. So if you're, you know, rocking all the goals, you're ticking things along really well with all of the food and the water and so forth, then have a look at your hormone function. So there are um, hormone tests that you can uh, do, which culture wellness can organise. But also have a look at if you're getting enough movement in your day. So movement is really important for evacuation and elimination. So not stressful movement because that can stress and inflame our bodies if we're, you know, smashing the cardio and pushing our bodies too hard. But any form of movement is really important. And sleep. Sleep will absolutely rock you from here, there and everywhere with regards to the Bristol stool chart. So, oh, Diane, you're there. Awesome. So your sleep will, will also paint a big picture on whether you wake up in the morning and, you know, have awesome elimination or not. And then if that's not going on for you, then um, having a look at uh, getting a stool test to see who's in there and who's not in there because that's a very important part of that elimination process is the different types of bacteria. So being 73, I just saw that you popped that up there. Yes, I would investigate your hormones. And as we age, our digestive system slows down. We don't make as many digestive enzymes. And so we need to have a lot more bitter foods. We need to be able to um, make sure that we're supporting that digestive fire through things like ginger, apple cider vinegar, rocket, all of those beautiful bitters. And we have to actually work harder on our digestive system. So once again, fermented foods at every meal is really important as we age. Very, very, very important. Um, yeah, so sleep not great and exercise hard. Yeah, so those things will help considerably. That's great. Thank you. Thanks, Diane, for being here too. Uh, okay, so we're going to move on to the questions about the Bristol stool chart. There was lots of fun to talk about stools and and uh, what number we are. It's the dedicated space for it in this group, so there's no need to be shy, and I love that we all got into it. Yeah. Um, what do, um, as a general overview, looking at things, yes, people can identify what the number they are on the, on the chart. Let's briefly look at what each of the numbers mean and what we can do about that. That you know, We've covered a lot already, so just anything that you, that you think we can add to what you've said um, would yeah. be wonderful. Yeah. So, yeah, but, I mean, basically except what you've already said there, that it can really mean um, inflammation, uh, if it's too fast and then the different levels of it pretty much is the diff different levels of inflammation. So we've got this continuum and we've got this sweet spot in the middle that we want to try and hold on to every single day. And then as we swing that pendulum, it's just the level of issue going on. So 
as you move up and down that chart, it's just how inflamed is your body? How little fiber have you got? And think of it as how big is my issue that I'm dealing with here? Mm -hmm. So if it's swaying a little bit in out of that, you know, middle continuum, that's normal. It's life. If you have a late night and you have an early morning, you know, you are going to have adjustments. We're not robots. We can't keep everything in complete order every day. But if you are right up the end of those continuums constantly, that there is a big issue going on and you really need to fix it. So that's probably the easiest way to look at it is how far and the swing between that inflammatory response and um, more of that hormonal and mechanical response that we see. Beautiful. I know for our family, we've seen unusual numbers on the Bristol stool chart this week because I missed yeah. the farmer's market on Saturday. Ah, and it's been yeah. so busy this week that I haven't gone and done a full shop to stock up on all the fresh produce. And so we were getting really creative with the dry goods that we had, with whatever veggies we had on hand. And so we weren't getting as nourished with all the fresh produce as we normally would. And so we certainly saw us dropping down in the numbers on that Bristol stool chart. So like you said, if we're varying from day to day according to what is happening, then it might not be such a big deal. If it's just a short term blip on the radar, we don't need to be too worried. Yeah. 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 My All friend right. Helen my friend Helen Patteron has an awesome stool chart on her website. Um do we have it? Did you did No, we put, no, we don't have it, but let's give if you know the website offhand, let me yeah, know and we'll yeah. post it as well. Yeah, yeah. So and she's just got some awesome little characters that go with each one and talk talk about them in detail. So um, that's a really good resource. It's hilarious. I love it. It's and I go hiking with Helen and I go hiking with a bunch of naturopaths and nutritionists. And I am not joking when we go into the bush and you know do a poo each day, you hear people screaming like woohoo and like talking about how awesome their poos are. And there's all these comments coming in and what happened and what's going on. It's just hilarious. It's like <laughs> it's awesome, constant com conversation about how awesome our poos oh, are. When yeah, you're that's so great. Um, I will share the link to Helen's resource and really it's fantastic, especially if you've got little ones in the family that you want yeah. to bring on board and just interest them in the whole identifying your poop um, situation. So we will link that. We'll do a summary post after the live tomorrow and I'll put that in. Mm -hmm. Uh, Silvana has said she ranges between a two and a four. She's occasionally a five. Could this be, okay, so we've just talked about this. Could be. Could this be due to some days where I don't eat a lot due to not being mm -hmm. hungry, so therefore down in fibre? And if I do eat something, should I try and make it mostly fibre rich? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so we've covered most of that. Anything else you feel like you need to add to that or we've yeah, been there tonight? Yeah, we're all good. All right, so it's 9 o'clock I have just seen. We've got lots of questions. How long do you want to stay online? Do you want to do another 20 minutes? Oh yeah, everyone... I'm happy. Yep, yeah, I'm happy with yeah. that. Yeah. Okay, awesome. Um, and then after that, like I said earlier, if anyone missed the beginning of the live, Kirsty and I will both pop in independently and do a follow up Q and A to answer the questions that we haven't been able to answer. And there's a lot of them. Um, mm -hmm. Let's get through a few more. Um, okay, because I don't want to lose the comment thread. Tanya has asked. She says she has lower back pain often. Mm -hmm. It seems attached to bowel movement. What can I do to help that? Okay, so lower back pain, if it's um, in the yeah low, lower down, we often sort of want to be looking at kidney function. So the first thing that I would, when I hear people talking about lower back pain is to flag kidney function, because that's exactly what's normally going on there. The other thing that we see with lower back pain is um, estrogen dominance, so too much estrogen, and that is directly linked to your bowel movement. So when you have too much estrogen, it can either become really sluggish or it can become really inflammatory and pass through really quickly. So um, you might see that it changes within your cycle, and if that's happening, we definitely know that it's an estrogen dominance thing. If the back pain is from kidney issues, then it will be attached to your bowel movements because of the dehydration that you get when your kidneys aren't functioning effectively. So there's two things that you can investigate there. It's probably one or, one or the other. 
Okay, thank you. Um, Sharon has just made a comment that she's a seven on the chart and she thinks it's from inflammation and the side effect to iron supplements. It's funny, I always thought iron supplements made you more slow and constipated. Is that yeah, it's not always the case. That is, it, Traditionally, that's what they do, but some of them, um, uh, especially the syrups, there's a lot of iron syrups out there that are prescribed and they are full of all sorts of things that can actually cause um, constant diarrhea as well. Oh, that's not fun. All right. Um, Meg had an interesting question. Um, she said that luckily she's usually a four, but um, she says, I normally have fructose malabsorption, but while I'm breastfeeding, which is the <laughs> case now, for some reason, my fructose malabsorption issues tend to disappear or be significantly reduced. And she's guessing it's hormonal. So strange, but I'm not complaining. I go between <laughs> three and fives normally. So again, we're talking about how our hormones impact our digestive system. Is there anything that you'd like to add to, to, add to that for Meg tonight? Yeah, only that if it, I see it all the time about, I was fine when I was pregnant and now it's terrible again. And it has a lot to do with that beautiful dance between those three amigos of your, you know, your progesterone and your testosterone and um, making sure your estrogen is in balance. So uh, once you're not breastfeeding, a lot of, um, you know, women, their progesterone just goes really haywire and causes all sorts of troubles and the estrogen goes right up and causes trouble. So um, when you stop breastfeeding and everything balances out, check your hormones if that starts because um, oh, and I'm not a fan of fructose malabsorption. <laughs> um, there's no such thing. There's something causing the issue of that fructose being degraded and fermented too much in the gut. So you want to find out who's in there and causing that. And is it hormonal or is it a small intestinal bacterial overgrowth? So then you can get to the point that you're not um, taking out fructose foods. You can have a much more varied diet. And guys, you can get a test for your hormones, just like you can get a test for your stools. In fact, Kirsty, you're going to laugh. Um, my hormone <laughs> test is sitting on the fridge. Yeah, the reason is it just so happens that I keep missing day, and it so happens day twenty-one this month falls this coming Sunday, and I'm going to be camping. So. Um, I hope I can still pull it off. <laughs> and so you can test the Dutch hormone and her team at Cultured Wellness and you can hear about that next week. Um, Anne says that since increasing her fibre, she's mostly fours on the Bristol stool chart. Yay. Um, prior to this, I was frequently experiencing one three. What's your take on different diameters for number four? Really skinny to quite thick. And I said to Anne, in all the different challenges we've run for the fiber challenge, I have never once seen that question. So I think it's really interesting and I'd like to hear your answer. Yes. So you can have, um, there's a really and Helen's uh, stool chart is wonderful for that because it talks a lot about, you know, whether it's skinny and whether it, you know, is a fat one and has they all have a personality to them. And that does tell you a lot about the how your body is digesting and absorbing the nutrients and how much it's getting that soluble fibre and the insoluble fibre to form that stool and also how those microbes are going. So, if it's skinny to quite thick, that's a difference between the soluble and insoluble fibre and also the hydration of the bowel. So you can, um, you know, if you really want to, and you can kind of take note of those different fibres that you're eating and how much water you're having and, and you'll notice this comes in and out, in and out. So things like psyllium husk will like really expand it. And then, you know, if you're getting more of the soluble fibre, it will be quite different. So, yeah, that's the reason why. And then obviously if it's chunky or if it's undigested, um, if it's a sludgy, if it floats, like there, there are so many different ways to describe your poo and what they're up to and the colour. So if it's yellow, you know, you really need to be looking at your liver function, your gallbladder function. If it's too, too, too dark, there may be some blood and some inflammation. So, yeah, you can really, really get to know yourself by looking at your stool. 
<laughs> love it. Uh, I really do. It's, um, it's a lot of fun talking about this because you don't get to talk about this many other places, right? This is fun that we no. get to all get to <laughs> and, and compare our poops, right? <laughs> um, yeah. Okay, so Terry um, is a six on the chart. Um, since okay, let me just reread this question. Um, she's a six since I have been having green smoothies and veggies. Does it go back mm -hmm. to a four if you're having daily smoothies? I used to be a one to two a lot. I'm a lot mm -hmm. not quite sure how that question reads, but can you comment on that one at all, or do we need some? Yeah, so that's probably just. Um, Terry has introduced some really new awesome foods and her body's getting used to all of those different foods and digesting it and getting used to it with regards to all of the bacteria. So um, it will settle down. It's a bit like that low and slow and it will come back into range again. You've just got to give your body time for that to happen. So I think that's what she's asking um, and that we kind of addressed that at the start of the session. Yeah, great. Um, talking about the colour of our poops, Sharon says, mm. my daughter was unwell with a virus and her poop was white. What would that mean? So when it's white, my our instant thought is a thrush candida overgrowth, so more of a, a yeast issue, so yeast infections. And definitely with the viruses, if it's um, driven by any types of um, things like Epstein-Barr, um, if it's they also uh, kind of go hand in hand with yeast overgrowth. Sometimes when people have viruses, they're prescribed antibiotics, even though it's not a bacterial issue, they're still prescribed antibiotics and then that can cause a huge thrush and yeast overgrowth um, and which can give those white poos. So that's the first thing that I would be looking at. But um, yeah, the, that's the poor liver and gallbladder is just not functioning effectively. Yeah, okay. Uh, we have uh, three more questions before we then move on to quite a big topic that I think you could just go to town on. So to give that the justice that it deserves, we'll get you to come back in and do another session on that one. Okay. Um, there are three uh, uh, questions left. Um, Isabel says, um, I've had chronic constipation for years and wasn't aware it was a problem. Went to see a naturopath a few months ago, did a detox and took some natural medicines to help and support. It worked well and I was another person. More energy, mm. better food. Anyway, my question is, is it possible to get my gut health back again without doing another treatment, just eating more fibre and drinking more water? Or do I have to do something else to restore that flora? Because after the 20 days, the professional disappeared and the constipation came back, um, thanks. Mm -hmm. And so she's also just, I follow up with her to ask what her fibre and water intake was like. She's about 20 grams of fibre, two litres of water. Um, and obviously she just can't get back in touch with her naturopath and wants to know if she can bounce back um, quite quickly using the, the tools that we've given her during this challenge. Yeah, yeah. so um, give it a try. So absolutely try increasing the fibre, try in increasing all the tools that you've been given. But if it's not happening, then the medicinal herbs that you were, you've you been given was probably to bring down an overgrowth or to balance out some form of um, dysbiosis within your gut. And that treatment generally takes, uh, you know, three to six months, if not longer. And so it may not have been finished. So um, the best way to look at that is to get an appropriate stool test to see if there's still issues going on in your gut that need to be treated. And then, of course, yeah, you can come and see us. We won't run away from you and we can help you with finding out what's going on and prescribing you some medicinal herbs. So we have naturopaths and nutritionists and, um, and also we've got all of our clinical health coach team. So there's lots of resources if you need it. But of course, give this a go and the tools you've learned so far, but there might be some more that you need to do. Yeah, great answer. Um, Marion asked another question about how hormones impact our digestive system. I think we've covered that really well, but in essence, she's just noticed that in the lead up to her period, she becomes bloated the week before yeah. and then bam, she's got number sixes going on. So um, yeah. we've, we've talked about about that and how our hormones can really impact our digestion, especially around that monthly cycle. So looking mm -hmm. at our fiber intake and looking at, at how our hormones are going is a really important thing. Yeah. Um, 
Marion has also asked a question about gas. She's a nice four every morning, she says, though I have a stinky get an hour of eating consistently. So I'd like to find out what's the cause of that. Yeah, so uh, we can have sulfide producing bacteria in our gut, which is basically the stinkiness that comes from our, you know, our food fermenting in our gut. So we eat it, goes in, we need the different bacteria to ferment that food to create the metabolites, so the off gases from that fermenting process. And those off gases and those metabolites are actually how we make our vitamins, our neurotransmitters, it's its kind of how our whole body functions. So we do want that fermenting process and those metabolites, it's very important. But if we've got a overgrowth or more bacteria and one, a really common one that I see all the time is biophilia wadsworthia, and that's a sulfide producing bacteria. And if that has grown too much in your gut, it's going to ferment your food and produce too much sulfide and then you're going to have gas. So you want to be able to bring down those sulfide producing bacteria strains so you don't get the stinky gas and you get that balance. So once again, those um, sulfur producing ones generally love carbs and sugar. And so getting back to whole foods, bringing down the sort of the big grains and the big carbs and those sorts of things, still keeping it really, you know, beautiful. You don't have to, you know, go no carbs or anything like that, but just, you know, utilize vegetables more rather than introducing grains or those kinds of things. So, but it's the bacteria, it's the dudes hanging out in your gut that's causing it is the overarching that's thing. thing. <laughs> Especially those sulfide ones, man, they're horrible and it's embarrassing. You can't kind of like, you're just going to sit there hoping that nothing's going to escape. It's terrible. Now, here's a question to close off on tonight that you, I haven't given you in that paper, Kirsty. Oh, okay. I'm like, where is it? <laughs> As we're talking about this gas issue and, and, and stinkiness, it makes me think of that song. How's it go, Jordan? Okay. Um, you think you you think your poop don't stink? It smells like roses or something. Is it is, is it is is it normal for our stools to smell? Or do you feel like perhaps if we're eating a really lovely balanced meal full of nutrients, is it possible that we could just have a neutral number two? No, like I'm asking because I think that that's a question that lots of people would actually wonder because you know we all we all think that our number twos don't smell, but in actual fact, <laughs> that you want to be interested to know what you're going to say about that. Jordan's yeah. laughing at me because he's embarrassed on my behalf right now. Oh, no. <laughs> hey, dude, you're the one wearing the blue dressing gown. <laughs> <laughs> I'm such, it's all right, everyone. I know Jordan. I, I am giving him grief, but I know him, so it's all right. <laughs> um, so you, we certainly shouldn't have an ammonia smell. We shouldn't have a sulfide smell. We shouldn't really have a like a, a toxic chemical smell coming from our butt <laughs> because you know that just shows that we're we're fermenting something that just shouldn't be there so no we are going to expel gas that's for sure but it shouldn't have a toxic smell and um in the toilet they also shouldn't have it a toxic smell so when it's got that chemical sulfur um ammonia i'm just trying to think of all the different smells that I get told about all the time or I've had myself. Um, acid is another big one, sweet smell. The, the, it can really range with what's coming out. Yeah, sweet. Um, so it's really, really, really important to... I hope you didn't hear that. No, Jordan, I didn't. Wants know, Jordan wants to know how, how I can get that sweet smell. That would be preferable. <laughs> It's already there. Didn't you know that? <laughs> it's already got it. <laughs> well, yeah. So, um, you, yeah. It, but it shouldn't. It shouldn't be smelly. It shouldn't be offensive. It. It really shouldn't. So beautiful. Okay. Thank you. That was an interesting little question at the end. Um, Kirsty, I'm so grateful for your time tonight. There is one more question that someone's just popped up in their thread. Are you happy to do one more before yes. we close? Up? All yes. Right. Thank you both for the wonderful fibre info, especially the ways of adding it into our family meals. The kiddos have no idea. Yes. Um, my question is, 
one of my kiddos is standing right here and she just gave Jordan an accusing look. My question mm -hmm. is, you coast these cultures and have done for, um, sorry, um, I'm not about there, have done for about two years. When I add the coconut, um, the coconut yogurt, yogurt to my curries, yeah. My curries, does the heat from the freshly cooked curry kill off the beautiful good bacteria? We stir yeah. it in as we serve. So she's not cooking with it, she's stirring it in as she serves. Yeah, that's such a great question. So yes, um, at a certain point, bacteria will start to die off when it's too hot. So if you bring it down to, um, you know, warm, that lukewarm, if you stir it through, then it's not going to compromise the um, CFU count of the bacteria. So that will be fine. But if it's boiling, you will definitely kill off some of the bacteria. So it's good. Just bring it down to lukewarm as you would eat and it will be fine. Yeah. yeah, great. Thank you. Yeah. And, um, and and that question was asked in the group um, about the diversity dough. And I was telling them that I think the, 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 the big feature of that diversity dough being a fermented dough is that it does just bring those carbs and sugars down to zero while still maintaining the goodness of the fibre and the nutrients. Exactly. And so yeah. there are, there's lots of different aspects that we can look at with some of these fermented foods and cultures. Yeah, and it was it was created out of a troubleshooting situation where I had been um, eating low carb and low sugar for quite some time. I think it's been over ten years now. I've been eating this way, um, and I just couldn't get the amount of diversity and the polyphenols and all of the important things that your gut bacteria need. But I didn't want to introduce grains and some of the other things that my body just seemed to flare with. And so that kind of just, I created it because I was like, I just need to get more of this fiber in without all the carbs and the sugar. And so went on a mission to find the tiger nuts and the slippery elms and all these really cool things that are good for your gut. So it will, it'll solve the problem. There's a whole lot of, you know, interesting questions here about intermittent fasting, the ketogenic diet, all of those sorts of questions a lot of the issues and um, the big myths that we see around the intermittent fasting ketogenic diet, you can just kind of bypass by using fermented foods, diversity dough and cyclical ketosis and making sure you're moving in and out of these things and not having a structured response to it. So, yeah, it's very cool. Yeah. It's really cool yeah. to like make breads and pancakes and muffins and and know that it's not going to spike your insulin levels and it's not high in carbohydrates it's um it's very oh man it was a game changer for our family when we first developed the diversity dough it opens up a whole new world of foods that you've probably yeah. missed for those yeah. people who are wanting <laughs> yeah. And do you know yeah. what? It, it's, uh, there's been more people than usual inside this group who are either already eating that way or who want to eat that way. And I think it's going to be such a wonderful solution for them. Yeah, yeah. No, it's it's amazing for me to watch the the kind of landscape change. I mean, if you talk to someone about intermittent fasting only even three or four years ago, no, it just wasn't it wasn't a common conversation. So it's really cool to see people aware of it. But now I just see all the mistakes everyone makes. So now we've just got to go and talk about how to really awesomely successfully do it to make it um, work for you. Yes. And look, there's some beautiful comments of gratitude coming yeah. through for both this session and the challenge. So thank, thank you all for, for saying those beautiful things. And we're so appreciative of you guys turning up and being so committed to your health. I loved yeah. reading today's thread in particular because today's thread showed us both how easily you are identifying your three next actions that you're going to take yeah. post this challenge. And to see that it was so easy for you guys to list those off is really heartwarming. And um, I'm really thankful for that. So mm -hmm. Kirsty and I will um, pop in again to answer the questions that haven't been um, that haven't been addressed tonight. We have topics of intermittent fasting and, and ketogenic diet. We have some specific food questions that I'll address. We have um, a couple of other topics. There's quite a few pages here. Um, no, no, I like how you've got one section just labelled random. I love that. <laughs> 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 Everything's all really technical and then it's just random. <laughs> yeah, random questions as well as lots of water questions. Um, yeah. 
So, guys, thank you for being here. We will see you tomorrow um, for our last video, right and early in the morning. And then at 1 p.m., Jordan and I will go live from the warehouse, hopefully not in the blue dressing gown. Um, but why not? Let's make let, let, let's let everyone see it. Why not? Um, <laughs> <laughs> Unleash the dressing gown. Unleash it. <laughs> Um, and then we'll keep in touch um, for the following week and, and we'll make sure that you guys get the link to hear from Kirsty again next week as well. So have a lovely night, guys. I hope you have a beautiful sleep. We're not going to keep you up too much longer. And um, we'll see you tomorrow. Thanks, everyone. See you later. Bye-bye.